Let's talk about sockets in C++. The network concept of a socket refers to the connection of one host to another through the combination of compatible IP addresses and ports. The software concept of a socket is a class hierarchy and draws its roots from the Berkeley distribution of Unix, or BSD, that is the Berkeley software distribution. Since sockets were designed for Unix systems, they work well in and are relevant to all forms of Linux. In addition, sockets have been implemented frequently with Windows WinSock programming. A developer will find that much, though not necessarily all, of their socket structures and TCP, IP, UDP code will function in Windows as they do in Linux. Sockets are said to be the receiving endpoints of a connection, and the attached connections between sockets linking two separate hosts are called threads. These threads are not the same as process threads. Socket programming is generally considered lower level programming, meaning higher level applications and graphical interfaces run over the top of its structures and objects. It generally takes the form of a client-server infrastructure, meaning a server socket listens for one or more connections from a client socket. There are certain rules that govern socket programming. For instance, there are different address domains and socket types that may be used in a connection. Two sockets must be of the same type and in the same domain to enable communication between hosts. Two main types of socket domains are Unix domain, which is a character string used where two Unix processes share a file system, and Internet domain, which is an Internet address and a port number. Let's break down the basic structure of an application using sockets and review the sequence of necessary events. First, you might want to decide on the WinSock version. You would specify the version of WinSock you wish to use. Version 2 is the latest version of WinSock at this time, and usually the one most people use. To do this, at the top of your code you could insert either define SOC version 1 or define SOC version 2. The next thing necessary to meet these requirements is a structure to contain the internet address known as SOC address n. The definition of that structure is as follows, struct SOCK ADDR underscore IN, and then in the structure are data members, in this case a short, which is the family, an unsigned short, which is the port, another structure, which is going to hold the IP address, IN ADDR SEN ADDR, and then a character array, which is usually always set to zero. Let's extrapolate on the structure's data members a little bit further. Send family specifies the address family and is usually the constant AF underscore INET for most socket communication programs. Send port specifies the port number and must be used with the function htons, which converts the host byte order to network byte order so it can be transmitted and routed properly when opening the socket connection. The reason for this is that computers and network protocols order their bytes in a non-compatible fashion, each the opposite of the other, so htons handles the conversion. Sin address holds the IP address returned by inet address to be used in the socket connection. And then finally sin0 is used with a character array buffer and usually set to zero. Now let's examine some socket functions. There's htons, which we talked about previously, and it converts the host byte order to network byte order. There's inet underscore addr, and this function takes the string you pass into it as an argument and converts it to the required form for use in the socket connection, negating the need to use htonl for the IP address. There's wsa startup, which starts the WinSock application programming interface. For example, I would use a long variable, in this case we'll call it successful, because when WSA startup completes, it returns an integer or long value. And then I would pass in a word and a WSA data object. Next is the bind function. And this binds a socket to the SOC ADDR underscore n structure containing the IP address and port used to build the connection. If you look at the example below, it will explain the syntax. Next is the listen method. And this tells the socket to listen for an incoming connection. It takes two arguments, one the socket to listen on, and two the maximum number of connections. Semxcon is whatever the maximum allowed for that system may be, so it's a symbolic constant that's often used in socket projects. An example of the syntax would be listen, slisten would be an instance of a socket, and semxcon a symbolic constant indicating use the maximum number of connections allowed. 
Finally, there's the accept method. This function waits for a connection and wakes when a connection is established, usually used when coding the server part of a client-server application. For example, look at the syntax below. Next is the connect method, which connects a client to a server that is in the listening state and set to accept a connection. An example of the syntax is listed below. Next, we have the WSA cleanup method. This stops the WinSock application programming interface. That is, it terminates the use of the WinSock WS2-32.dll file or dynamic link library. An example of the syntax is as follows. Finally, there's the close socket function, and this closes an open socket. Take note that you will need an instance of the following structure to pass in as an argument when calling WSA startup. It is a type definition of a structure, WSA data. And here's what that structure looks like. The data members are two word objects and two character arrays and two unsigned short integers and a pointer to a character. The data each of these data members holds is pretty much self-explanatory. W version and W high version hold version information. The description holds description information. Max sockets and max UDP datagrams would also configure those attributes. Once a connection between two sockets is established, whatever the server outputs is streamed to the client and whatever the client outputs is streamed to the server. We can split socket programming up into two broad categories, TCP versus datagram sockets. That is, there are two basic kinds of sockets, transmission control protocol and user datagram protocol, or UDP. First, let's examine TCP sockets. TCP, or transmission control protocol sockets, are connection-oriented and constantly verify the delivery of the packets sent between them. TCP does this by calculating a checksum before sending a packet on one end and after receiving the same packet on the other end. If the checksum is the same, the packet is good, whereas if it calculates to a different value, the packet is recognized as damaged in transit and the recipient asks the sender to resend the packet. This feature of TCP is both its upside, that it makes data transmission reliable, and its downside, it consumes a great deal more bandwidth than would be required if packets were being sent without the costly verification process. When two sockets connect over TCP, they create a virtual circuit, meaning that data not only arrives at its destination reliably, but in the proper sequence from where it was sent. TCP transmission is useful for applications like file transfer and messaging, where packets have to arrive intact and in sequence at their destination, and therefore a bandwidth-consuming verification process is required. TCP, providing reliability, is normally combined with IP, providing routing, into the TCP IP protocol stack. The process for initiating a TCP socket connection is as follows. You would instantiate an object or build an instance of the socket class, and then once you do, you would call the constructor and pass in the appropriate arguments. The method for sending data with TCP sockets is to simply use the send method, and the syntax is as follows. The method for receiving data with TCP sockets is to use the RECV or receive method, and its syntax is listed below. The next broad category of socket applications we will look at are those that use UDP sockets. UDP, or User Datagram Protocol sockets, are not connection-oriented, meaning that they do not guarantee or verify the data that they transmit. This means that if the data is damaged in transit, it remains unusable by the recipient and the frame is usually dropped. However, this also means that UDP socket transmissions consume much less bandwidth since additional data is not constantly sent back and forth between each socket for checksum comparisons. UDP transmission is useful for applications like video streaming or internet radio stations where a great deal of data has to be sent using as little bandwidth as possible and it is not really imperative that each packet arrive intact at its destination and a few drop frames can be tolerated. The process for initiating a UDP socket connection is as follows. You would instantiate or build a socket object, 
But in this instance, the argument or parameter you would pass in would be SOC dgram. The method for sending data with UDP sockets would be to use the send to method instead of send. And the method for receiving data with UDP sockets is to use receive from instead of the receive or RECV function. There are three basic strategies for implementing the server side of socket applications. The first strategy is concurrent or connection oriented servers. These handle multiple clients simultaneously and create a new socket and a separate process to handle each new connection requested. Typical applications of this strategy are programs like Telnet and FTP servers. This places a high demand on the server. The next strategy involves single process concurrent servers. These handle multiple clients simultaneously while maintaining multiple open connections and listening for messages on each one. It only awakens processes when new data arrives. The third strategy involves iterative or connectionless servers. These provide only a single message to the client and only open one socket at a time, usually using UDP and datagram sockets instead of TCP sockets. This means the message the server transmits is not guaranteed to arrive at its destination. Often it responds to client requests as a single process instead of forking into multiple processes, providing lower demand on the server's resources. A typical application employing this strategy would be a network time server.